This is the Retail Business Holiday Act from the Government of Ontario, which was presented in 1980. It was actually a statute of Ontario revised in 1980, Chapter 453. And it was amended in 1986, 1987, 1989, more specifically February 1989. And then it was prolonged until all the way to 1992. And this is actually um, an interpretation of this law, having been involved with it to fight it, fight against it. Sunday law undercover. That's what this particular law or amendment was all about. Although it's called very fancy title, Retail Business Holidays Act, Loi sur les jours fériés dans le commerce de détail. But, and it's the government of Ontario. This is a province of Canada. There are 10 provinces and there are territories in Canada, but this is one of the province. Actually, it's the largest, the largest province as far as population. And this was actually a, the Retail Business Holiday Act was brought to us by this gentleman, which now is part of the United Nations. He is the ambassador and permanent representative of Canada to the United Nations in New York. And before his appointment by the government of Canada, Mr. Ray served as Canada's special envoy on humanitarian and refugees issues, continuing the important work that he began in 2017 as Canada's special envoy to Myanmar while also addressing other pressing humanitarian and refugee issues around the world. The former Premier of Ontario and former interim leader of the Liberal Party of Canada, Mr. Ray, was elected 11 times to federal and provincial parliaments between 1978 and 2013. He stepped down as a member of parliament in 2013 to return to legal practice and in particular to work with indigenous communities and continue his work in education, governance, and human rights. His passion for social justice dates back to his early days in student politics and community service. So we will lead you with the rest of the study. He has gone, he's a lawyer, he has gone to the faculty of law, very educated person. At that time, when this law came out, the Retail Business Holiday Act, that's when Mr. Ray was actually the premier of Ontario around that era. And at that time, this is when this came out. This is a poster that was picked up during this campaign, you could say, of wanting to close all the store in Ontario, more specifically for when the people were having no tourism in the area. Only those who were in tourist area could leave their store open on Sunday. I need my family on Sunday. Would you want to work on Sundays? Let's have fairness for families. Call your local counselor to enforce the law for everyone's sake. And they choose that beautiful little blondie kids with beautiful eyes. This poster was picked up on public billboard. It was not stolen, it was appropriated. During the Sunday law issue of Ontario, 1989-1992. Notice the words, enforce the law for everyone's sake. Fairness for families. Under a garb of moral reasons, the dragon speaks. This, of course, is added by the editor, which is myself. These were kept for a long time because we believe they were very important. And what was the business, all the act was actually a meeting that the retail business only the act, it were open, these meetings were open to the public. And they were held at different cities and towns all over the province of Ontario, north, south, east, west. And each city had to decide if they wanted their store to be closed on Sunday or open on Sunday. And it became so well known throughout Ontario for those sessions, which would occur maybe two times or three times a year. And pretty well because of the setting that was presented to me as a, I was trained as a religious liberty secretary by the Conference of Ontario, the, the Seventh-day Adventist Conference. So I was involved with it 
by following the leader of the Religious Liberty Department at the time. And then later on, the church basically, I wouldn't say abandoned, but they were promised that they could keep their store open on Sunday because they were Saturday keeper, a kind of a compromise. But we're not here to judge, we're just making a statement of fact. So I found myself by myself in the whole province of Ontario, speaking against this retail business, Holiday Acts, which was full of people when it came to those meetings, which were in agreement to close the store on Sunday. And because it was also, as we will explain, it was being pushed by very important organization, very important groups of religion. And basically, literally at the end of the session in 1992, and we will tell you the result at the end, what happened. I was the only one speaking against this retail business on the app. And I was actually asked, they would pay my gas and I was asked to come and speak in different town in order to explain what was that act all about. The people could not understand what was going on. So right now I would like to read to you this particular um, presentation that I had an opportunity to present more than once, but this one in particular was right in Toronto at the city hall in front of the people, the councillors, and also the people from the public. And you were given five minutes to speak. And the television was there if you were one of the first 10 to speak. And so it was not a direct, television, it was basically filmed and it would pass later. But nevertheless, by the grace of God, I always managed to be part of the first 10. So I was on television because I wanted this message to be passed. So right now, I'm going to read it for you just like I did when I was in front of the television. And if you think that it's not really great to read your speech, wait and see if you have to speak and you're the only one who do not agree and everybody else agree. How would you know that they don't agree and they agree? It was very easy. They had those huge buttons, uh, not exaggerating. They must have been about five inches wide and big button and uh, five inches diameter. And the people were wearing them on their jacket. Well, I didn't wear them because I didn't agree with it. So they knew I was against it. And I had been cornered about that more than once. But the Lord preserved my life always by his grace. So let us read this together. I'm going to read it because that's what I did for five minutes. It takes five minutes. And you will understand the way I was trained and the elements I'm bringing into this. And I don't usually use I in my presentation, but this is my presentation. To the Economic Development Committee. The reference is Tourism Exemptions Designated Area in Toronto Retail Business Holidays Act. I would like to thank the Economic Development Committee and you, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me to give my opinion regarding the tourism exemptions for certain possible designated areas in the Greater Toronto. Personally, and as a private enterprise owner, I believe this decision of opening or closing one's own business should be left to the discretion of the individual owner. If one does or does not wish to shop, work, be with his or her family, have entertainment or worship, which I believe will be next on Sunday or any other day of the week, no government, federal, provincial or municipal has been voted in and is assigned the right to compel anyone in such a basic individual choices. These are personal and moral issues, not civil issues. For example, family togetherness is a matter of free choice and not a matter of legislation. Are such a proponents suggesting the notion that a municipal law is required to compel people to love one another and thus prioritize their time commitments to the family? Surely, our enlightened society is capable of appropriating the time necessary for family life even if there are choices to be made among competing distractions. I have been engaged in public hearings for the Retail Business Holidays Act since 1990, and I've always been concerned of the compelling approach the government and other groups and organizations, such as labor unions, churches, and businesses, have demonstrated at these meetings. 
The issue, though, wanted to be presented under an economical and political cloak, always became a moral, social, and religious one. A more social and religious one. From a report obtained from the Ministry of the Solicitor General under the title of Principles and Commitments, the question is asked, what is, why is the government committed to come and pause the legislation? Answer, the fundamental goal of common pause day legislation is to provide a common pause day to help strengthen family and community life while protecting the rights of retail workers. We believe this is a valid, indeed compelling reason to fulfill our commitment in this area. While wanting to be honorable, this statement alone confirms my concerns based on my knowledge of history. It is always the same pattern. When a government takes the stand that it must compel the citizen that have brought in into power in order to strengthen their family and community life while claiming to protect the rights of its workers, we must return to other periods in history and study our well-meaning governments sponsored by dictatorial churches, to say the least, and willingly ignoring the rights of freedom and liberty of the individual, have imposed their beliefs in the name of safeguard of family life, religion, and whatever other good reasons they could find in order to bring church and state power together. The sad results that followed these enactments should make us aware of the danger ahead, inquisition, persecutions, wars, revolution. I would like to read this declaration of principles which it would be well for us to apply in order to preserve our freedom. The God-given right, given right of religious liberty and liberty of conscience is best exercised when church and state are separate. Government is God's agency to protect individual rights and to conduct civil affairs. In exercising these responsibilities, officials are entitled to respect and cooperation. However, religious liberty and liberty of conscience entails freedom of choice, to be with the family or not to be to worship or not to worship, to profess, practice, and promulgate religious beliefs or to change them. In exercising these rights, one must respect the equivalent rights of all others. Attempt to unite church and state are opposed to the interests to each, subversive of human rights and potentially persecuting in character. To oppose union lawfully and honorably is not only the citizen duty, but the essence of the golden rule, to treat others as one wishes to be treated. I'm a very concerned citizen and a Seventh-day Sabbath keeper. I do stand for freedom of choice and would not impose my religious beliefs on anyone, although I would be glad to let you know why I believe the way if you ask this way if you ask me. I recommend that the Economic Development Committee members revoke any statutes given to any particular day or any day of the week for a common pause day and leave the citizen free to choose to open or close their stores based on their own individual choice, regardless of tourism exemption, because you understand and appreciate that equality right, fairness and justice are values which Canadians cherish and that all laws should be drawn up to enhance these values. Thank you. I'm not sure if that took only five minutes, but usually you had to respect, otherwise they cuffed you off. Nevertheless, the point is this law was declared, or this amendment from Mr. Bobry was declared non-constitutional, which means they were never able to basically enforce the Retail Business Holiday Act in Ontario. And when you check, even in 2023, as this is presented uh, on the internet, you will see that some cities chose to close their store, but they left it to the merchant to do it. So it was never imposed or enforced in the sense that the people had to obey it. Now, as we're entering into this particular presentation, we will spare you the reading because if you look attentively to the Google search of the links, they're all here at, it's in numbers 1317 and it's in file 18. This is the one we're covering right now, file 18. 
and it's the first page in the method where you click on and you will find all this information. These, for some of you, we're sure that you will say, well, oh, it's so old, 1990s or 1980s. It's not that old, it's an era. So this one is actually July 9 from the Time Magazine, 1990. And specifically is the Congregation of the Holy Office or the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which are new names for the old Inquisition spirit. And Pope Benedict, who just passed away, it's him here. His name was Ratzinger, his last name. At the time, he was not a pope. And he was the head of the Congregation for the Faith. He was the head of the, the, the Inquisition. And this still exists today. Most people do not know that. And he was also, uh, um, I don't know if you know this, but Ratzinger or Pope Benedict was a very, 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 he was a scholar of Germany. He was a very good teacher, a pianist, an artist, very well known uh, for his knowledge. He was actually a, um, he had his PhD in theology and very well known. He was very well known and he was also um, the right hand of John Paul II. And many believe that the As Domini was written by Ratzinger, it was not written by John Paul II. So, which we are studying the S. Domini. So basically we can encourage you to read this in file number 18 of numbers 1317. So we will spare you the reading. It's very small here at this time, but the whole reading has to do with the congregation of the Holy Office for the doctrine of the faith. And this particular gentleman was starting to rise against the papacy, which is not acceptable when you are supposed to be a um, Catholic, a Roman Catholic, and he spoke very openly how, you know, he, he was called a dissident of the Catholic Church because he spoke against the Catholic Church and the teaching and its interpretation. And he still, to this day, the Roman Catholic Church still believe the Pope is infallible and in whatever he says, it stands. And now theologian and the Roman Catholic Church choose to speak up, but their freedom is not any better than you could say in the past. And because the Catholic Church has no longer a power of the civil government, thank God, these people can still be remain alive, but they're excommunicated usually. And uh, this is coming more and more in the front. Roman Catholic people are like Martin Luther now, they're speaking against what they do not agree, but then on a belief of them, they're shut down. And even though they're right, so we, we encourage you to read this because people say, well, I'm not Catholic, I'm not interested. Well, the Roman Catholic Church has played a big role in the first Sunday law in 321 AD in influencing Constantine, the Roman emperor, and this will be repeated again. And in this session, we intend also to show you again the PowerPoint that we have prepared that shows again the development of the falling away of the Christian church, which started around the time, a bit before the Roman Catholic Church in the era of 300 AD. But we want you to understand that the Roman Catholic Church is called to play a very strong role at the time of the end again. And that has to do with Revelation chapter 13. The Roman Catholic Church has been given the power and the authority and the seed from the dragon itself. And when Protestantism, we've seen that, and when spiritualism comes together, the threefold power, apostate, apostate Protestantism with Catholicism and spiritualism, that's when we're going to see Revelation 12, 13 taking place. The attack against the woman, the pure church, and the setting up of the Sunday law all over the world. First, it will be in America. United States will change from the lamb like beast and it will become speaking like the dragon. The Catholic Church has already started to conquer United States and you will see the result of it very soon. This is the Roman Catholic Church. The beast dressed in scarlet. A beast is a government according to the book of Daniel chapter 7. Their kings, their governments. The international political authority of the Roman Catholic Church is greater than ever. At the time in 1998, when that was written, 160 countries, according to the United Nations, they are 225 countries in the world, 700 languages. 
the 160 countries now, the International Political Authority of the Roman Catholic Church have diplomatic relations with the Vatican in those 160 countries. It's very, very interesting. This was a French magazine, L'Actualité, May 1st, 1998. So we are giving you some information. You may say, well, those are old. We're covering a very important era, so bear with us. And at that time, in the 1990s, that's when, with a team of missionary, we went around the world and we distributed 60 million great controversy from Russia to India, to Japan, to Hong Kong, Singapore, Vietnam. We went to Taiwan, we went everywhere. We went to the Philippines, we went to Australia. Everywhere the people heard about this teaching of the great controversy. And at the time we were really hoping that something magnificent would come out in the 1990s. And it was coming out with the new world order under Mr. Bush and all what we know of the 1990 era. But as we present in our first seven days of history, we have not done what we were supposed to do in declaring the true biblical calendar as a church. And the work has been postponed. Everything was in place. It was in place in 1888. It was in place in 1939, just before the First and Second World War. It was in place in 1990. And in 1995, when the biblical calendar was brought up to the attention of the leader again, it, the leaders, it was refused. So by the grace of God now, the biblical calendar has come out. And we believe that the Lord wants it to be known. And in that era of the 1990s, you will see different Sunday laws that were basically this material were picked up. And this one is from London, September 29, 1990. That was when we were traveling around the world. So we were picking up. We were very keen about finding out what was going on. And in Germany at the time, they were talking about closing the store on Sunday and this thing was happening in Ontario as I was still involved in this. Uh, as you saw, the last speech I gave and it was declared non-constitutional was 1992. So it was a very strong era about Sunday trading bill and closing store on Sunday. It was not having to do with worship, but still, you see here, 1993, April 16, this was obtained while we were in Europe. St. Lucian churches want Sunday to be respected. This is an interesting story because instead of the government imposing a Sunday law, it was the people now asking, please close the store on Sunday so we can go back to church. This was the, they were the people asking the government to give them a Sunday law. So this, you can see, it may sound far away, 1993, 2023. But usually a 40 years period represents a generation in the Bible. And at times, if it doesn't happen when it's supposed to, because of the reason we're giving you the biblical calendar has to be proclaimed in order for the Sunday law to be fought with. It's not going to be Saturday against Sunday. It's going to be Sabbath against Sunday. This is the battle we're entering. It's the true Sabbath against Sunday, the false Sunday, the false calendar, the Gregorian pagan papal Roman calendar. So please that keep that in your mind that these, they may sound old, but they are actually very, very, actually very present. And this is the Canadian um, Charter of Rights, and that it has to do with actually the Sunday law, which finally the... And Canada is a, is a very young country. We don't have a constitution like the United States. We have a confederation. And it was established in 1867, compared with 1796 for America. And in 1992, we were also given a Charter of Rights. But the Charter of Rights is identical to all the other charters, like the United Nations, protection of freedom of religion, freedom of speech. But they do not separate church and state. So here is basically, I'm not going to show that it permits municipalities to decide whether many of the exemption would apply in the areas. So as you can see in Ontario, it's always left to the municipality. It can be very confusing because one municipality can be closed on Sunday and one is open. Right now it's all open, but usually when you remember the 60s or the 70s for people who have lived in Ontario in the 80s, it was the same. 
many things were closed on Sunday and in the evening. Now it's practically open all night. 1970, another Ontario Law Reform Commission published its report on Sunday observance. So you can see they're wanting to push it. And it would be the same in your country if you were keen on what your government is up to. I would suggest this is your first homework. Don't go and bother the president yet. You're not prepared for that. But try to search even on the internet. You can find a lot of information now, specifically for your country, where the countries stand, with, especially if it's a Christian country, where do they stand with their religious uh, stand on Sunday keeping? India. When we were missionary in India, we were very, very surprised. India is not Christian. They have never been a Christian nation. Their religion is Hinduism, now mixed with Muslim, Buddhist. But India, when we were there, was closed on Sunday. And we asked them, we said, why are you closed on Sunday? You're not really, you're not, you're not promoting Christianity. They said, no, but the British, when we were taken over by the British, colonized by the British, you could say, though they were a very, very, um, you know, wealthy nation, uh, they imposed that we close on Sunday. And when we were there, they were still closed. Now I have not been to India lately. I don't know if they have their freedom of opening their store on Sunday, but they were closed. 1976, Retail Business Holidays Act. You see, the one we defended, we spoke, I spoke against was 1990-1992. It's not new. It comes into force in Ontario. So basically, um, and they were, listen to this, they come into force in Ontario while the Federal Lord's Day Act was directed at compelling observance of Sunday as a Sabbath. The Retail Business Holiday Act is designed to provide common pause days in the retail sector and to ensure the availability of leisure activities for the community. Like if we're asking them when we should rest. The civil government have not been given the prerogative to decide for their citizen when they should get together with their family and they should rest. They're supposed to fix the road. There is holes in the road. They're supposed to protect us with the police. That's the judicial system. They're supposed, that's not their job to tell us when we should get together with our family and close our store so we can have a rest. We didn't elect them for that. 1986, again, Charter of Rights and Freedom. And there are some cases that were brought in court against that. Some people did not agree. And it says here, the Bill of Rights does not have statute as a constitutional document, and the courts have generally been reluctant to give it much scope. So that was in 1963, because we didn't really have a Charter of Rights yet. 1985, we did. The constitutional protection for freedom of religion guaranteed by the Charter of Rights and Freedom produces a different result in 1985. And again, here we have... Um, the Supreme Court of Canada holds that the Federal Lords Day Act is unconstitutional. So even though they had passed the um, the Charter of Rights, the government would not recognize it or the court did not recognize it. So that tells you that we're not really protected, even if they enact all the fancy material. Keep informed. This I will pass quickly. This is actually the old Lords Day Act, the old one when they enacted it in the 1902 era. And it tells you the prohibition, it's in English and in French. And it tells you also the punishment when you broke the Sunday. At the time, they had to pay. And you're talking 65 cents, but they had to pay, nevertheless. You may want to get interested in your country and find out if they have all these papers. And of course, you're familiar now with Diaz Domini, which we have discussed in our seven day, the first section of history. And we will still continue to study those articles. And we have seen the eight day. We have seen that at the end, towards the end of the article, 86 of them, John Paul II, who's passed away, was encouraging the people to talk to their government in order to enact a Sunday law. John Paul II will be back in our next session. He's part of the 1990 era, which brought an end to the Cold War between Russia and the United States very important figure and yet he was a pope he was with the vatican rome so they have gained some ground a lot the holy days or holy days it's holy days or holidays and this was written by samuel bakioki which is he passed away now he was a professor of theology at andrews university 
very good teacher. He was also the writers of many books and sometimes thought to be a Catholic, but having read his books, I can guarantee he was no Catholic just by what he was reading, he was writing because he was against certain things like uh, no drink of alcohol and that is not Catholic principle. The Catholic priests drink alcohol even to this day. And we will pass that to you to again, search it, file 18, numbers 1317. It's an article that he submitted to the Liberty Magazine, which is the Liberty Magazine is the, um, we could say the religious liberty magazine of the Seventh Church. Very, very interesting article. And he stands, of course, with separation of church and state. Should the state protect the observance of religious holy days by making them civil holidays? The answer of those committed to the separation between church and state is clearly no. Civil laws should not be passed to protect the observance of the religious holy days of a particular church. Such a laws violate the First Amendment of the American Constitution. Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion. Then he proceed because this was the Catholic Church who was wanting to ask the United States to bring in, in their efforts, the Catholic Church teaching of a religious annual holidays as civil holidays. And so Dr. Bakioki stood against it. And that's what we need. We need pioneer like this who understand. And basically that also you can see here he's mentioning the same appeal is made by Paul, Paul John Paul II in his pastoral letter, Dies Domini. So that was after 1998. So it's not that far from us. And many people are not even aware of the Dies Domini written by John Paul II, that is to appeal to everybody to ask for the, the Roman Catholic people, to ask for a, a Sunday to be imposed so people can rest on Sunday and go to church on Sunday. And you think this is old fashioned, this thing, it, it's old? It's gonna be carried through. And if we are right, you have nothing to lose by studying. And if we're wrong, you will have lost nothing by studying, but we know we're right. So as you can see here, it talks about 1999. And as we said, we cannot read it, it's very long. And we know that if you're interested, you will find it, you will search it, and you will be able, even in our presentation in the agenda, we will give you the PDF for this particular study because numbers 1317, although sometimes it has uh, audio, not on all those papers, but it has all these format here are PDF. So you're more than welcome to make copies of them and preserve them for your research. So report on Sunday law legislation and other related events. In closing, we would like to read for you this particular article taken from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 136. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The very atmosphere is polluted with sin. Soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials, and the great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be base metal. Instead of being strengthened and confirmed by opposition, threats, and abuse, they will cowardly take the side of the opposers. The promise is, them that honor me, I will honor. Shall we be less firmly attached to God's law because the worlds at large have attempted to make it void? Already the judgments of God are abroad in the land as seen in storms, in floods, in tempests, in earthquake, in peril by land and by sea. The great I am is speaking to those who make void his law. When God's wrath is poured out upon the earth, who will then be able to stand? Now is the time for God's people to show themselves true to principle. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. To fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. The nation will be on the side of the great 
rebel leader. On which side will we be? We have to make a decision now before it's too late. May the Lord bless you and cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace always.